So this workshop is Juan Monte Carlo and machine learning. And I, you know, I have done a bit of QMC and I've done a lot of machine learning. So which one to choose, right? So I chose neither. Uh, it's not about either of those things. There's no stochastic part uh, in this talk, except possibly for bugs introduced in the code. Right? Uh, so I'll explain. So this is work that happened during the pandemic. And uh, I'll explain what it is and why it might be of interest. So it's a, an alternative way of doing electronic structure calculations that uses some aspects of DFT, uh, but also uh, uses it to try to get more accurate energies. So I think none of the results I'll show are anything close to the accuracy that we heard about uh, in the previous talk, right? And they should be judged on the basis of, of DFT type accuracies. And I'll explain what it is, and then I'll explain, I'll show a little bit about the calculations just for the uniform gas at zero temperature, a little bit of formal theory, and I want to show you something we're in the middle of doing uh, that we don't really have results on yet. So this was my group uh, last year, and the work I'll talk about, uh, a lot of it was done by Ryan Peterson and Chris Chen. Uh, we'll see one of the papers is by him. He's an excellent graduate student and he was an excellent undergraduate. Ryan McCarthy uh, was a UC uh, presidential postdoc uh, uh, and he was sort of doing this on the side. And that should be, say, John Kozlowski, uh, who's a chemistry graduate student who's been doing the warm, dense matter. And uh, uh, the, actually, the main driver is Dennis Perchek, who is a retired physicist who's living in Irvine. And we were trying to get to do things with classical fluids, but we got distracted by this along the way. OK. And, and it's based on three r recent papers. Uh, the main one that I'll talk about is, is, is this one, which came out about a year ago. Uh, but then there's been these sort of follow-ups, and there'll be more to follow. And the reason I'm talking about this and not, say, the machine learning work that we've been doing is I realize that in this audience, virtually everybody here is better at doing calculations than I am. And I don't think this, these kinds of calculations are hard calculations for you guys to do. I mean, you have to do a bunch of coding in order to do it. Uh, and I'd really love it if, if people started trying out this method. And part of the reason I uh, was thinking about that was because if, about a month or two ago, I gave a virtual talk at Urbana, and, and I, I mentioned this in passing, and people were very interested. Okay, so this is a, a sort of different way of doing electronic structure. So, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, wave functions now, finding them with neural networks, path integrals, uh, you know, traditional quantum chemistry methods. Uh, and then, of course, there's cone sham DFT, which is typically much cheaper, and therefore you can do bigger systems. And you find the energy from an approximate exchange correlation functional, right? Uh, that's how the whole thing works. Uh, and it also yields a single particle density, in principle, it's exact in practice. You know, it has endless problems uh, that we're all aware of, but it turns out to be useful in an awful lot of situations. So we're going to talk about a different way of doing the calculation, which is we're going to find the pair density uh, by calculating the conditional probability using cone sham DFT. Okay. Uh, so my notation is the same that I always use, right? Here's Hamiltonian. Uh, Hamiltonian is made up of one body pieces plus electron-electron interaction. It's just a Coulomb repulsion. Uh, this is the one body piece, and then this is the uh, attraction to the nuclei, all in atomic units. Uh, so single particle densities, you sum over you square the wave function, integrate over everything, and sum the spins, multiply by n, and you get uh, the single particle 
probability density. So the pair density is, is the same object, square, square everything, sum over all the spins, but don't uh, integrate over two of the coordinates. And that's the probability density for finding one electron at R1 and a second one at R2. And if you know this object, uh, then, for example, you can directly calculate the electron-electron repulsion. Uh, so, and, and in DFT, we'll also do, use the adiabatic connection in order to get the exchange correlation out of this. Uh, but this, this guy here, this pair density, can always be written as a density times a conditional probability density. So this guy here is given that there's an electron at R, what is the probability of, of finding one at R prime? And this is a function of the two variables, but we will think of it as being sort of parametrically dependent on this R and look at these conditional probability densities. Uh, now, often, so when you're doing DFT, we often have models of the exchange correlation hole. And this is actually the exchange correlation hole at full coupling strength, uh, if, if we're using the full pair density. Uh, so we will write it that way. And we have rules, you know, that this thing uh, integrates to minus one. Uh, and so if we write it just, we can, we can think of this as the difference between the actual density and conditional probability density. But the conditional guy, you know, being a, a, den a probability density is always greater than or equal to zero and must integrate into one less electron, right? We've, we've said there's one electron where we are. And we're looking at the distribution of the rest of them. Uh, now, something I'll call the Holmberg cone map is, is just the map. Be we'll, you know, ignore degeneracies and stuff like that. Take the sort of simplest case. And... Uh, we will consider the, the potential. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between potentials and densities. So we can think of the one-body potential always as a functional of the ground state density. That was proven in the original paper. Uh, and I would consider this for a given electron-electron interaction here, the repulsion, the Coulomb repulsion. So we're going to define something called a conditional probability potential which is uh, a potential, a one-body potential, uh, given Coulomb interacting electrons, that uh, whose ground state density for n minus one electrons is the conditional probability density. And therefore, uh, and, that, and so this guy is just the Holmberg cone potential based, uh, you know, based on this density, if it exists, right? We know it's unique. Uh, it doesn't always exist. In practice, uh, non-existence is rarely a problem. And we can likewise define a conditional probability cone sham potential, which is the cone sham uh, map uh, for uh, uh, that density as well, right? So in the cone cham conditional probability potential is the one you would use in a cone cham calculation that gives you uh, the, the interacting density as the ground state of a non-interacting calculation. So what's nice is if you knew this guy, and actually we can write them both, although I don't think I'll use them, uh, if I give this as a function of the interaction, right, I can make alpha zero, get the cone sham one, and alpha equal to one gives me the fully interacting one. So what's interesting is if we, if we knew this guy, right, we could calculate the pair density. And, you know, based on the theorems of DFT, if we had this guy exactly, we would get the exact pair density. And we wouldn't need to evaluate a, a density functional to get the energy. And when you think about it for a few decades, you realize the main purpose of DFT is producing energies as a function of the nuclear positions. 
And so this is a way of avoiding having to calculate, having to construct an accurate exchange correlation energy functional. Uh, now, we're still going to use the cone sham method. We'll use the cone sham method to calculate these densities. But in practice, uh, cone sham DFT turns out to be generally very, very good at calculating densities. There are cases where you know, the, the exact details of the density really matter, but there are sort of certain classes of problems, and also we sort of know where they are. But generically, it gives you very good densities. So if it can do that, then if, you knew, if only you knew this uh, guy, uh, you would be able to calculate the energy directly. Now, in doing the calculations, uh, we wrote down this, and we'll talk about this a bit. This We call it the blue electron approximation. So, so uh, this delta V, I think my slides are a little out of order. Uh, the delta V is the difference between the, the external potential and the CP potential. And also, there's a slight mix and match of, uh, of notation. Our notation evolved as we went along. So uh, you know, in the final papers, I think we put tildes on top of these guys just to, instead of marking them with CP because we needed room for superscripts. OK, so we see that for large separations, and in many circumstances, this is a very good physically motivated approximation to the change in the CP potential. Uh, and, and so what, well, well, I'll go through this. But also, we realized as we went along that this, this can't be right for the electron-electron cusp, which is built into the uh, pair density. You get this factor of two because you know, the masses of two electrons are the same. And so you get half the reduced mass. So when you do the scattering, you get this feature. So then what we did was we wrote an approximation, which is uh, a local. Uh, we now call it a local blue electron approximation, where we smoothly go from uh, this at large distances to this at small distance based on the length scale of the gas. Yeah. In the top equation, why would there be some kind of a screening or something at large distance? Why would it be the bear? Okay, so, so all the calculations I'll show, well, I'll, uh, well, I'll go through the examples, but uh, I think it's on the next slide, yeah. Uh, this is when you're far, uh, well, it, yeah, you'll see. So this, that's more far in a finite system, right, uh, rather than in, in an extended solid. Uh, OK, so, uh, so yes, so when, say, one electron is on one molecule far away from another one, you never worry about the exchange effect between that electron and the ones on your guy, right? So in that situation, uh, that is the potential that the guys will see. Uh, uh, or when a molecule, say, approaches a surface, right? Again, you're not seeing exchange of electrons between one part of the system and the other part. And this will become exact, and we'll see examples of this and then, yes, if I take a finite system and I go out far away in the tail of the density, again, I'll get the right answer with that simple approximation. And this is, this is uh, sort of from a quantum point of view. We were also motivated by, we were actually, our original interest was in sort of classical DFT for, for fluids. But then we'll see that this sort of morphs into high temperature uh, DFT, uh, but the original idea goes back to Perkis. Uh, so if you think of the uniform gas or of a classical liquid, and you change reference frame to sit on one particle, then the system looks like this n minus 1 inhomogeneous particles in the field of the impurity. And now you can do this in classical DFT because the particles are distinguishable, right? Uh, and you can actually show you know, exactly the same kind of thing that Matthew was talking about with the, uh, the Wigner crystal. Uh, 
you see these relations. Uh, but in, in classical DFT, you can write down exact relations between the pair density of the homogeneous bulk and uh, the actual density of an inhomogeneous system with one, with one of the particles distinguished. So, and that's why we call it the blue electron approximation, and people use this term uh, uh, in order to say that it's like one of the electrons is p painted blue. Now, this is to this sort of argument, right? I tried it out on some of my quantum chemistry friends. Uh, I think it was uh, Fred Manby, and he was appalled, right? And he said, you can't do that, right? And I said, well, we are doing it, right? Uh, from a quantum chemistry point of view, this is totally heretical because, of course, you know, the particles are indistinguishable. And an interesting question is, what approximation have you made when you approximate the statistics as classical statistics? So this was our first sort of calculation for the uniform gas. And uh, this is our, our CP calculation, and this is exact. And you can see that you can barely see the difference. Uh, and this is, this is the error. Uh, but we'll see that we had to sort of do some engineering to make that happen, which is a little ugly. Uh, but we sort of followed up and did it in more detail. So we'll get to that. Uh, so in order to make that happen, we'll see that what we had to do was we had to add a potential at the origin just for the high density limit because, of course, this blue electron potential misses exact exchange. Uh, so we added a, a very large repulsive potential in order to reproduce exchange and then sort of smoothly turned it off to get the results that you'll see. Now, and you can see here that if we plot this impurity density, we, you know, we've taken an uh, electron and looking at its repulsion from the origin, uh, we see the exchange correlation whole is, is very good. Uh, this is at Rs equals 1. Uh, we were also did two electron ions, uh, a variety of the two electron ions, and we get uh, extremely good answers for both the electron-electron uh, repulsion and the, uh, the potential contributions to it. Uh, this is Hooke's atom, two electrons in a parabolic well. And this is the density, uh, the radial, uh, no, this is the, the density itself. This is the exact density. It's, uh, this, this system is nice because it's very easy to write down analytically the exact solutions. This purple one is actually the pure blue electron approximation, which gets the cusp wrong. And then this blue one is this local blue electron, which smoothly gets the cusp right. And you see that the density is much better. This, this, uh, this, is, this is the conditional probability density uh, starting from the nucleus, from, from the center. And again, you see the potential is right uh, at the origin there, because we get the cusp right, the electron-electron cusp. And then most important of all, probably, is this curve for H2 dissociation, which, you know, is a hard thing to get right with your standard uh, semi-local functionals. Uh, and uh, this is an unrestricted PBE calculation going to the wrong dissociation limit. And this is our local blue electron approximation. And you see it dissociates to the correct uh, twice the hydrogen atom energies. OK, so, so this was the ini initial work uh, showing that this thing was pretty useful. Oh, and this again is, this is looking at the details of the H2 energy components. And again, uh, they come out very well. And here we sort of slightly cheated because we used the exact density because we really wanted to see if our thing will give us correct energies. In principle, you should you know, do everything self-consistently, and that becomes a bit of a question when uh, 
when you're doing a strongly correlated system, where do you get the exact density? For H2, as we stretch it, uh, we'll see that what all this works on the total density, not the spin density. And uh, an unrestricted calculation actually gives you a pretty good total density. Uh, it's just that the spin densities are, are wrong. OK. Uh, and then this is one of the major applications we were interested in, is the temperature dependence. So having gotten our zero temperature uniform gas working, we then turn on the temperature uh, and do a finite temperature cone sham calculation. All that is is occupying the uh, cone sham orbitals with, with Fermi functions. Uh, and this is a parameterization, uh, including, I guess, some of the QMC data that Matthew and others have generated over the last five or six years. Uh, as a function of temperature, and then uh, we have three different CP calculations. Uh, one is uh, CP cone sham, and so what we do is simply we take the potential that we use for the zero temperature case, turn on you know the Fermi occupation factors, and uh, we seem to get you know within about 5 or 10% good agreement with the exact curve. Uh, what's nice about that is you see as, as the temperature goes up, so this is 1 is equal to the Fermi temperature. And as we go further, in fact, we can do the calculation. So I'll show you a simpler version of the calculation doing a Thomas Fermi calculation instead of a cone sham within the conditional probability idea. And you can show that they must go to the correct answer in the high temperature limit. And this is going even further. This green line is using classical DFT of distinguishable particles, which is always done at finite temperature, and showing again that you get the same result. So this is actually a Debye-Huckel calculation. Uh, and what's important about that is you know, a, a, a major issue in warm, dense matter for cone sham, you know, cone sham DFT has been doing very well in warm, dense matter for the last 20 years or so. But a major issue is that you're limited in how high a temperature you can go because you can't get it to converge because you have too many what would be unoccupied orbitals. You have to start occupying so many orbitals that the whole thing uh, collapses. So this is nice in the sense that it's, uh, you can do this with the Thomas Fermi calculation. Now, so as I say, all these errors are much larger than the ones we've heard about an hour ago. Uh, but on the other hand, the idea is that you should be able to do these calculations. They will be more expensive than a traditional DFT calculation, but I think less expensive than uh, using a neural net to find your wave function. Uh, and actually, yeah, here's a picture of the error in the free energy of the uniform gas. Uh, and actually, oddly enough, we need to check into this a little bit more, right? Our, uh, our classical DFT calculation, at least of the, you know, seems to do, have less error than a, a CP Thomas Fermi calculation, finite temperature Thomas Fermi calculation. Uh, and this is where you know our cone sham stopped working because we couldn't get it to converge, right? Uh, okay. And in fact, after I think it was after the paper came out, Tobias Stornheim at Attila's place nicely pointed out that uh, their uh, parameterization of the uniform gas, uh, uh, free energy at finite temperature was a little different from the one we compared with. And in fact, we were closer to this probably more accurate uh, parameterization. OK, so those are the sort of main applications. Uh, but we are just, you know, we're sort of fundamental theorists. And we just do these simple model systems to see if the stuff works. And then we just hope that other people will find it intriguing enough to try it out themselves. And of course, it is just 
doing a whole bunch of cone channel DFT calculations, right? Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, so, so what you have to do in order to do one of these calculations is, in principle, for every point in your system, you have to do a separate cone sham calculation. So first, you do your regular cone sham, and you get your ground state density. Then you go back, and at every point in the system, you do another cone sham calculation to get this uh, CP density. But of course, they're all totally independent, and so you know you can parallelize them to hell, right? Uh, um, and you just taught them up. Oh, another thing is, you know, so this is based on the idea of the exchange correlation whole, right? But we're calculating that whole. We're not sort of having a theory about how it behaves. And uh, you know, the whole, you know, you can see that our, you know, if we get sort of five, ten percent, we're pretty happy. But then you integrate up the whole thing, no pun intended, and uh, so that can, you know, there can be lots and lots of sort of cancellations of errors. You don't have to be accurate at every point, and which we're not. Okay, so then this is Dennis's work. Uh, yeah. So, so when you uh, remove an electron, usually what kind of uh, energy ionization energy you get is very functional dependent, right? But but now you're integrating it to calculate sort of the ground state energy. Is it very functional dependent or sort of? Uh, uh, okay, so good question. So, okay, uh, essentially not, although I think we did all the calculations probably with PBE, but we don't expect it to be so, uh, a whole lot of functional dependence at all because all we're using the functional for is to calculate these densities and then we integrate up to get the energy. So if I use a different functional, if I use LDA or PBE, I will expect to get a very, you know, slightly different density, which will have, a, you know, the difference in the energy will be down in the errors that we're seeing, uh, I would expect. Unless you're in one of these density sensitive cases, uh, and that's a, that's a little different, but even then, the, you know, the integrals that you do to pull out the energy. So, and we do get some, yeah, ionization energies, and they're pretty good. Any other questions so far? Okay. So then, the, yeah, this is the second part is Dennis's work. So this was a paper we did just going over exactly how we did this uh, calculation, and there was a part of it that I wasn't satisfied with, putting in this big uh, Gaussian repulsion. Uh, and also, we had to sort of slowly turn it off. So the way Dennis did the calculations is we take, you know, about 1,000 electrons in a sphere. We set up boundary conditions so it's to make the density, uh, you know, uh, flat at the edge of the sphere. And what you do is you do the calculation with the n electrons and n minus 1, right? And your, your blue electron there is at the origin. And so, you know, the little Friedel oscillations you get from the edge all cancel between the n and the n minus one electron system. Uh, so then this is representing, you know, your, your pair correlation function. Uh, uh, and this is doing the uniform gas either with the pure blue electron approximation or doing this uh, uh, local blue electron approximation that interpolates uh, very much along with the same kind of form that Andreas used for the uh, uh, short range, in the, you know, the range separation uh, functionals. Uh, and you can see uh, that in this case, it's almost bang on, but then as we go down to low densities, it's not perfect. It's that uh, dashed red line. But again, you can see that when you integrate up the energy, there'll be a cancellation for being too high there and being too low there, which so it doesn't mean that the whole is perfect, but the energy comes out good. And this was the this is the calculation with, without putting in that big Gaussian potential at the high, for the high density limit, and you can see that things are working pretty good for all RS values. But then we get a divergence because of this lack of exchange uh, in there. So in fact, in this case. 
what we did was a spin DFT CP calculation uh, where we took the exchange uh, G uh, for, uh, for the parallel and we used it to calculate the anti-parallel contribution. And since the exchange has an, a simple analytic formula, we, we sort of don't feel that we're cheating when we use that. And we just keep it at the exchange and calculate the other part and then calculate the energy. And what we find is then, of course, it works extremely well at high uh, densities and uh, because, you know, a lot of the energy is dominated by uh, the exchange piece, and then as we go down in density, it turns out not to work quite as well as our regular blue electron without, uh, uh, without adding anything in. Uh, and so, uh, so we ended up with our spin, sort of our spin version does very well at high densities, and then it's better to go with the pure blue electron at, at low densities. Uh, okay, and one little aspect I want to mention for the uh, aficionados, we then went through the Thomas Fermi calculation, and at zero temperature you can get an analytic solution that's almost right, you can make an approximation and get an analytic solution, and it's kind of fun, you see the usual Thomas Fermi uh, weirdness where, you know, the thing is, is zero up to a certain point and then turns on. And so these curves you can get almost perfectly analytically and that gives you, you know, very good energies. Uh, but you can see that the shape of the hole is not, is not great. But again, these are the worst case uh, scenarios for the Thomas Fermi at zero temperature. As the temperature goes up, it gets better and better. The relative error goes down because uh, it becomes relatively exact for high temperatures. Okay, so the second, the next paper uh, that's come out is uh, Ryan Pedersen's, and so I borrowed slides from him from a talk he gave last week. He's an excellent uh, physics graduate student. Uh, and this paper was just to go over the formal theory behind this CPDFT. Uh, and to do that, what, to make nice pictures and to make it easy to understand them, we use this 1D electronic structure lab that Steve White and I developed about 10 years ago uh, so that we can very quickly get very accurate results. So using DMRG, and we use exponentials that are fitted to soft coulombs, and we can make uh, atoms uh, you know, so for both the repulsion between the electrons and the attraction to the nuclei. And so we can get, ex you know, exact quantities very quickly and so do the comparisons. So it turns out our CPDFT works less well in one dimension than in three dimensions, but it's great for making pictures uh, of the exact quantities, right? So here, like we have one dimensional helium, this is the ground state density up here, and these are reference points. These, so this is in 1D. Uh, so if we have the reference point at the center here, you get this very this symmetric conditional probability density that doesn't look very different from half the total density because it's sort of exchange dominated. But then as we move the reference point over here, you can see that the density conditional probability density becomes uh, distorted. Avoid, you know, avoiding this point, and then we're able to, you know, uh, find the potentials that give rise exactly to those densities. And you, could, and you see this kink here in the potential. This is the cor corresponding thing to, from the exponential, like the cusp in, in Coulombic systems in 3D. So in this, it's, it's nice because the areas under these curves integrate up to the numbers of electrons. There's four here in this 1D beryllium, and then three in the conditional probability densities, and you can see this hole with the missing, you know, the purple one is at this reference point. Uh, so these are, uh, this, this paper has a, a, a lot of nice pictures of exact CP potentials and densities. And it also points out 
all, you know, a variety of exact conditions that a CPDFT should satisfy, uh, and then also sort of which ones of them this local blue electron uh, calculation satisfies. Uh, and also, yes, an important point is that it turns out that in the strictly correlated limit, as lambda goes to infinity, uh, it gives you the, the right answers. Uh, and perhaps more important practically is uh, when here this is uh, just a cartoon that Ryan made of, uh, uh, of, of 1D H4 and uh, stretched, and you see that you have density at, on, over all the atoms. But then when you want to calculate the uh, blue electron approximation for the CP density, what it does is it excludes uh, density from the point where you are, uh, and so, and puts it all on the other three, which is exactly the correct thing to do to get strong static correlation right. And as you move it, uh, the one that's excluded moves with it. And so when you do this integral, you find that it, it's going to go to zero in the stretched limit because of this lack of overlap. Uh, and in that paper just at the end, we just made some plots of exact CP densities for helium, but this is now in three dimensions using this Gausslet uh, basis that Steve has developed over the last few years. Uh, and it's showing the, so here are the two densities for, this is, I guess, the reference point, And you see that uh, the, this local blue electron approximation is doing very well. If we plot the contours of the potential that's going with them, it's not as good. But this is sort of demonstrating the general principle that, you know, uh, as long as your potential is pretty good, you will tend to get, uh, a, you know, and has the right physical properties, you'll tend to get a, a good conditional probability density. And then even that, you get to integrate over. And you also integrate over the uh, coupling constant in the adiabatic connection formula. So uh, it's very forgiving of any little uh, errors in that. Any, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, I have just a few little bits. Are there sensitivity issues involved? Uh, yes. Uh, so, well, in the, in the pure case of just the pure probability densities, uh, if there are, it looks like they're very mild and probably no worse than the ones we usually run into in, in sort of DFT, right? about V representability. Uh, however, if you spin decompose everything, uh, what you can show, is, so, so we talk about spin CPDFT meaning uh, where you take an electron of a given spin at a position and you ask what is the, the CP density. So that's one version, but then a second version is you could do spin DFT. So like there's, you know, there's four different uh, combinations of spins in the pair density. So if you do both, if you do both the spin DFT and you, you determine the spin of the reference electron, uh, there's a, pro, a slight complication, which is that you can show that it doesn't integrate up to a definite particle number. And so then you'd have to use ensembles to, to get that right. So uh, whereas in the spin, uh, if you do the first thing that I said, we have pictures of that. And we show that that seems to be OK. And of course, what can happen is if you have same spins as, as r go, prime goes to r, this thing must go to 0. And you know, that means you have to have some potential which would force it to be zero, which is going to be a very ugly potential and pro probably not allowed, right? So nodes in the spin CP, spin densities, will cause issues. And there can also be issues as you go to the exchange limit. Uh,
but, it, but generically, you know, and for doing just total densities, it looks like it's fine. But uh, we can't prove that uh, by any means. Yeah. Brenda. I was wondering if you can discuss differences between, uh, so the Laura Gagliardi and Don Trubar have this, this uh, multi-configurational pair of density. Yes. I guess you can get rid of the multi-configuration. How, how different is that? So, th so, so this is sort of totally different, but let me take that as a sort of representative. Uh, so, you know, and there's the whole, you know, there's a lot of things that are functionals of pair densities. We never look at the functional of the pair density. So we have no sort of wave function representability problems. We just avoid all them by saying we're just going to use cone sham DFT to calculate these densities, right? And in the same way that, you know, we get an approximate density in DFT, right? We get an approximate pair density out of this procedure, you know, who knows or necessarily cares if it's the pair density of any given wave function in just the same way we've no idea when we do a DFT calculation what wave function it might have come from. In fact, you know, there almost certainly isn't one. Yeah. Have you, Tony. Uh, have you tried to um, do some sort of, you tried about doing some sort of fitting procedure to find out what D would be that get the uh, homogeneous electron gas? Uh, we we have we have played various games along those lines, but given the sort of errors that we get with these things, it's sort of like we feel that we've done enough, at least for now, with the uniform gas to get these things that are within five or ten percent. Uh, but of course, one could actually find the exact potentials with an, yeah, and you have to do an inversion, right, to get the, so, so we haven't done, done that. Uh, so that's why in, in, in Ryan's paper, we did that, you know, we did the exact calculation for little 1D molecular systems and atoms, uh, and in that 3D case that I showed you, but we haven't done it for the uniform gas. Uh, it could be, you know, it's, it's an, it's, Presumably an exercise, but we haven't thought it worthwhile. Uh, how's my time, Mark? We've got about uh, eight, uh, seven and a half minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is now what I'm going to show you is one of, uh, well, it, it turns out a lot of people are suggesting uh, a lot of uses uh, for this kind of machinery, but you know, before we start using it for lots of things, right, it would be nice to find out if it's working decently. Uh, but this was one of the ideas that I had had uh, from early on. So, well, actually, this word shouldn't be generating, this should be calculating the temperature dependence of PBE. So, a long issue, uh, in these, these war warm dense matter simulations has been the neglect of the temperature dependence of the exchange correlation free energy. So a lot of the successes in the last decade or two have used ground state functionals. And there's a reason, a, a very good reason for that. Uh, and yeah, let's face it, it's usually PBE, right? Now we know, due to work of Matthew and lots of people, but it's been refined, I think, year by year, the temperature dependence of the uniform gas. So you can parameterize that, and then you could run a warm, dense matter simulation with LDA and put in the temperature dependence. However, the successes over the last 20 years have been because of things like GGAs and, and hybrids. You need the higher accuracy for the materials uh, or else, you know, it's not good enough. And then you could say, well, I could put in the temperature dependence in the LDA part, but you know you're going to screw everything up because you'll have temperature dependence in one and temperature dependence in the other. And you give reason, you can give good arguments for why neglecting the temperature dependence is actually probably a very good approximation, a good approximation, let's say.
But the only way to really know is if you put the temperature dependence in and you see what happens, right? And it's hard to really test it because it isn't like you've got a whole pile of quantum chemical data lying around. So we're going to calculate it. And it's very simple because lots of people forget that the PBE is based on a model for the exchange correlation hole. So John Kozlowski has been working on this very hard and we're making progress. Uh, so, so this is the exchange correlation energy of PBE as a function of the gradient at a given RS value. And we engineered uh, by matching the on top hole and, and, and the energy, we got a, the potential which starting from our uniform gas potential recovers the uh, gradient dependence of PBE, produces a hole that looks like the hole that the PBE is modeled on. This is at essentially zero temperature. And all we're going to do is then do the calculation, run the calculation for the hole at finite temperatures. Uh, and here we're doing it. Uh, this is for the uniform gas. This is the picture I've been showing you before, more or less, and how well it works. For the uniform gas, this is the parameterization, and this is our CPDFT. And just in the last month or so, Johnny showed a picture of this at the March meeting. So this is totally preliminary. These may not be converged and all sorts of things, but what we see is we, we simply take the same potential and turn on the temperature, and we're ignoring the temperature dependence that should be in that potential, but that's a pretty small effect. And what we see is that we get a bunch of curves at different gradients as a function of temperature. So this simply calculates what this temperature dependence is. And we've done some preliminary looks at things that people have suggested in the literature. It looks different, right? Uh, and this is because PBE, the rationale behind it, lots of people forget, is not the exact conditions, it's the exchange correlation hole. And all we're doing is generating what that hole looks like at finite temperatures. Uh, so there are zero parameters, but of course there are approximations. Okay, the last thing I need to mention, this is a mea culpa. So I'm, I'm quite embarrassed. Uh, so this idea originally was one that John and I discussed when I first started as a postdoc with him in 1993. And we actually did a little bit of work on it, but then we got distracted by this little thing that we were working on called a GGA, right? And uh, those who have long memories will remember PW91, and that led to PBE. But the notes on this sort of got put away. And what I hadn't realized, although Paula Gori Georgi tried to tell me several times, right, that she had, in fact, Later, John and, and her had pursued this idea. Uh, and I was only, when Ryan gave a talk last week, that I realized that I was only vaguely aware of the first paper and not all these other papers. And they have pursued, you know, there are very similar ideas built in to these papers. And then later, she was working with Andreas. And I sort of noticed a couple of days ago, some of those two electron numbers are very similar to theirs. And due to the pandemic, and I sort of lost track of an email thread, these weren't referenced in our, our uh, letter and, were, and in that first uniform gas paper, but they'll be referenced in all the subsequent papers uh, once we've analyzed exactly what the differences are and the similarities. And the language is a bit different, uh, but the basic idea, some of the basic ideas are there. I think what might be, uh, but I'm not certain until I've gone through them all, this idea of, of an exact potential uh, may be new to us, but I'm not certain. And of course, there's other similar-ish ideas that go further back in the literature. Uh, but I'm really sorry that we missed, this, we missed these and that was my fault. OK, uh, so to summarize, alternative approach to electronic structure. It's more expensive than DFT, but should be very parallelizable. It relies on an approximation to this potential, right? 
if you knew this potential, you get the exact energies. So it really becomes a game of how well you can approximate that. It recovers within about 5 or 10%, the uniform gas at all temperatures, no self-interaction error, correctly dissociates H2, and in fact, Ryan now proves any, you know, any length of chain of hydrogens. Uh, and then, of course, given the setup, it's likely to be very useful for warm, dense matter, especially if Thomas Fermi can be used to do the calculations, then it'll be really cheap. But nobody has tested it out yet, so I'm hoping somebody here will. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, and I realized I did the whole thing with my mask on. <laughs>